Chapter 63 I was staring at a ruined wall. There were a few last patches of plaster, but most of it was a rough stones. Many had fallen and lay among crumbling mortar against the foot of the wall. Then I heard very faintly the sound of goat bells. For some time I lay there, still too drugged to make the effort of finding where the light I could see the wall by came from, and the sound of the bells of wind and of swifts screaming. I was conditioned to be a prisoner. Finally, I moved my wrists. They were free. I turned and looked. I could see chinks of light through the roof. There was a broken doorway fifteen feet away, outside, blinding sunlight. I was lying on an air mattress with a rough brown blanket over me. I looked behind. There stood my suitcase with a number of things on it, a thermos, a brown paper packet, cigarettes and matches, a black box like a jewelry case, an envelope. I sat up and shook my head. Then I threw the blanket aside and went unevenly over the uneven floor to the door. I was at the top of a hill. Before me stretched a vast downward slope of ruins, hundreds of stone houses, all ruined, most of them no more than gray heaps of rubble, decayed fragments of gray wall. Here and there were slightly less dilapidated dwellings, the remnants of second floors, windows that framed sky, black doorways. But what was so extraordinary was that this whole tilted city of the dead seemed to be floating in midair, a thousand feet above the sea that surrounded it. I looked at my watch. It was still going, just before five. I clambered on top of a wall and looked around. In the direction in which the late afternoon sun lay, I could see a mountainous mainland stretching far to the south and north. I seemed to be on top of some gigantic promontory, absolutely alone, the last man on earth, between sea and sky, in some medieval Hiroshima. And for a moment I did not know if hours had passed or whole civilizations. A fierce wind blew out of the north. I returned inside the room and carried the suitcase and other things out into the sunshine. First of all, I looked at the envelope. It contained my passport, about ten pounds in Greek money, and a typewritten sheet of paper, three sentences. There is a boat to Fraxos at 11.30 tonight. You are in the old city of Monemvasia. The way down is to the southeast. No date, no signature. I opened the thermos, coffee. I poured myself a full capful and swallowed it, then another. The packet contained sandwiches. I began to eat with the same feeling I had had that morning of intense pleasure in the taste of coffee, the taste of bread, of cold lamb sprinkled with oregon and lemon juice. But added to this now was a feeling to which the great airy landscape contributed of release, of having survived, of resilience. Above all, there was the extraordinariness of the experience. Its uniqueness conferred a uniqueness on me, and I had it like a great secret, a journey to Mars, a prize no one else had. Then, too, I seemed to see my own behavior. I had woken up seeing it in a better light. The trial and the disintoxication were evil fantasies sent to test my normality, and my normality had triumphed. They were the ones who had been finally humiliated, and I saw that perhaps the astounding last performance had been intended to be a mutual humiliation. While it happened, it had seemed like a vicious twisting of the dagger in an already more than sufficient wound. But now I saw it might also be a kind of revenge given me for their spying, their voyeurism on Allison and myself. I had this, being obscurely victorious, being free again, but in a new freedom, purged in some way, as if they had miscalculated. It grew, this feeling, it became a joy to touch the warm rock on which I sat, to hear the Maltemi blowing, to smell the Greek air again, to be alone on this peculiar upland, this lost Gibraltar, a place I had even meant to visit one day, 
analysis, revenge, recording, all that would come later, as the explanations at the school, the decision to remain or not for another year, would have to be made later. The all-important was that I had survived. I had come through. Later I realized that there was something artificial, unnatural in this joy, this glossing over all the indignities, the exploited death of Allison, the monstrous liberties taken with my liberty, and I suppose that it had all been induced under hypnosis by conscience again. It would have been part of the comforts, like the coffee and the sandwiches. I opened the black box. Inside, on a bed of green bays, lay a brand new revolver, a Smith & Wesson. I picked it up and broke it. I looked at the bases of six bullets, little rounds of brass with lead-gray eyes. The invitation was clear. I shook one out. They were not blanks. I pointed the gun out to sea, to the north, and pulled the trigger. The crack made my ears ring, and the huge brown and white swifts that slid their way across the blue sky above my head jinked wildly. Conscious's last joke. I climbed a hundred yards or so to the top of the hill. Not far to the north was a ruined curtain wall, the last of some Venetian or Ottoman fortification. From it I could see ten or fifteen miles of coastline to the north, a long white beach, a village twelve miles away, one or two white scattered houses or chapels, and beyond them a massively rising mountain, which I knew must be Mount Parnon, visible on clear days from Barani. Froxos lay about thirty miles away over the sea to the northeast. I looked down. The plateau fell away in a sheer cliff, seven or eight hundred feet down to a narrow strip of shingle, a jade-green ribbon where the angry sea touched land, and then white horses, deep blue. Standing on the old bastion, I fired the remaining five bullets out to sea. I aimed at nothing. It was a feu de joie, a refusal to die. When the fifth crack had sounded, I took the gun by the butt and sent it whirling out into the sky. It paraboled, poised, then fell slowly, slowly, down through the abyss of air, and by lying flat at the very brink, I even saw it crash among the rocks at the sea's edge. I set off. After a while I struck a better path, which twice passed doorways that led down into large rubble-choked cisterns. At the south side of the huge rock I saw, far below, an old walled town, on a skirt of land that ran steeply from the cliff bottom down to the sea. Many ruined houses, but also a few with roofs, and eight, nine, ten, a covey of churches. The path wound through the ruins and then to a doorway. A long downward tunnel led to another doorway, with a hurdle across it, which explained the absence of a goat herd. There was evidently only one way up or down, even for goats. I climbed over the hurdle and emerged into the sunlight. A path with a centuries-old paving of slabs of gray-black basalt graft down the cliff, finally curving toward the red ochre roofs of the walled town. I picked my way down through alleys between whitewashed houses. An old peasant woman stood in her doorway with a bowl of vegetable parings she had been emptying for her chickens. I must have looked very strange carrying a suitcase, unshaven, foreign. Cal espera, poiseisai, she wanted to know. Pupas, the old Homeric questions of the Greek peasant. Who art thou? Where goest thou? I said I was English, a member of the company who had been making the film, Epano. What film, up there? I waved, and it didn't matter, and ignoring her indignant queries, I came at last to a forlorn little main street, not six feet wide, the houses crammed along it, mostly shuttered or empty, but over one I saw a sign and went in. An elderly man with a moustache, the keeper of the wine shop, came out of a dim corner. Over the blue iron mug of Retzina and the olives we shared, I discovered all there was to discover. First of all, I had missed a day. The trial had not been that morning, but the day before. It was Monday, not Sunday. 
I had been drugged again for over twenty-four hours, and I wondered what else, what probing into the deepest recesses of my mind. No film company had been in Monemvasia, no large group of tourists, no foreigners since ten days ago, a French professor and his wife. What did the professor look like? A very fat man, he spoke no Greek. No, he had heard of no one going up there yesterday or today. Alas, no one came to see Moon in Vasia. Were there large cisterns with paintings on the walls up there? No, nothing like that. It was all ruins. Later, when I walked out of the old town gate and under the cliffs, I saw two or three crumbling jetties where a boat could have slipped in and unloaded three or four men with a stretcher. They need not have passed the handful of houses that were still inhabited in the village, and they would have come by night. There were old castles all over the Peloponnesus. Corone, Metone, Pylos, Corifacion, Pasava. They all had huge cisterns, could all be reached in a day from Monembasia. I went over the causeway through the gusty wind to the little mainland hamlet, which was where the steamer called. I had a bad meal in a taverna there, and a shave in the kitchen. Yes, I was a tourist, and questioned the cook-waiter. He knew no more than the other man. Pitching and rolling, the little steamer, made late by the Meltemi, came at midnight, like a deep-sea monster festooned with glaucous strings of pearly light. I and two other passengers were rowed out to her, I sat for a couple of hours in the deserted saloon, fighting off seasickness and the persistent attempts to start a conversation made by an Athenian greengrocer who had been to Monemvasia to buy tomatoes. He grumbled on and on about prices. Always in Greece, conversation turns to money, not politics, or politics only because it is connected with money. In the end, the seasickness wore off, and I came to like the green grocer. He and his mound of newspaper-wrapped parcels were referable and locatable, totally of the world into which I had returned, though for days I was to stare suspiciously at every stranger who crossed my path. When we came near the island, I went out on deck. The black whale loomed out of the windy darkness. I could make out the cape of Barani, though the house was invisible, and, of course, there were no lights. On the foredeck, where I was standing, there were a dozen or so slumped figures, poor peasants traveling steerage. The mystery of other human lives. I wondered how much Contrice's mask had cost. Fifty times more, probably, than one of these men earned in a year's hard work. So had cost their lifetime. Des Ducans, Millet, hoeing turnips. Beside me was a family, a husband with his back turned, his head on a sack, two small boys sandwiched for warmth between him and his wife. A thin blanket lay over them. The wife had a white scarf tied in a medieval way, tight round her chin. Joseph and Mary, one of her hands, rested on the shoulder of the child in front. I fumbled in my pocket. There were still seven or eight pounds left of the money that had been given me. I looked round, then swiftly stooped, and put the little wad of notes in a fold of the blanket behind the woman's head, then furtively left, as if I had done something shameful. At a quarter to three I was silently climbing the stairs in the master's wing. My room was tidy, all in order. The only thing that had changed was that the piles of examination papers were no longer there. In their place were several letters. The first one I opened I chose because I couldn't think who could be writing to me from Italy. July 14th, Monastery of Sacro Speco, near Subiaco. Dear Mr. Orth, your letter has been forwarded to me. I at first decided not to reply to it, but on reflection I think it is fairer to you if I write to say that I am not prepared to discuss the matter that you wish me to discuss. My decision on this is final. I should greatly appreciate it if you would not renew your request in any way. Yours sincerely, John Leverrier. The writing was impeccably neat and legible, 
the rather crabbed into the centre of the page. I saw, if it was not a last forgery, a neat crabbed man behind it. Presumably on some sort of retreat, one of those desiccated young Catholics that used to mince about Oxford when I was an undergraduate, twittering about Monsignor Knox and Farm Street. The next letter was from London from someone who purported to be a headmistress on nicely authentic headed notepaper, Miss Julie Holmes. Miss Holmes was with us only for one year, in which she taught the classics and also some English and scripture to our lower forms. She promised to develop into a good teacher, was most reliable and conscientious, and also popular with her pupils. I understand that she was embarking upon a stage career, but I am very pleased to hear that she is returning to teaching. I should add that she was a very successful producer of our annual play, and also took a leading part in our Young Christian School Society. I recommend Miss Holmes warmly. Very funny. Next I opened another envelope from London. Inside was my own letter to the Tavistock Repertory Company. Someone had done impatiently, but exactly as I requested, and scrawled the name of June and Julie Holmes's agent across the bottom of the page in blue pencil. Then there was a letter from Australia. In it was a printed black-edged card with a space for the sender's name to be written in. A rather pathetically childlike hand had done so. R.I.P. Mrs. Mary Kelly. Thank you for your kind letter of condolence in her recent tragic bereavement. The last letter was from Man Taylor, inside a postcard and photographs. We found these. We thought you might like copies. I've sent the negatives to Mrs. Kelly. I understand what you say in your letter. We must all feel to blame in different ways. The one thing I don't think Allie would want is that we take it hard, now that it won't do any good. I still can't believe it. I had to pack all her things, and you can imagine. It seemed so unnecessary then. It made me cry again. Well, I suppose we must all get over it. I am going home next week, and she'll see Mrs. K. at the earliest possible time. Yours, Anne. Eight bad snaps. Five of them were of me or of views. Only three showed Allison. One of her kneeling over the little girl with the boil. One of her standing at the Oedipus crossroads. One of her with the muleteer on Parnassus. She was closest to the camera in the one at the crossroads, and she had that direct half-boyish grin that somehow always best revealed her honesty. What had she called herself? Course, the candor of salt. I remembered how we had got in the car, how I had talked about my father, had even then only been able to talk to her like that because of her honesty, because I knew she was a mirror that did not lie, whose interest in me was real, whose love was real, that had been her supreme virtue, a constant reality. I sat at my desk and stared at that face, at the strand of hair that blew across the side of the forehead, that one moment, the hair so, the wind so, still present and forever gone. Sadness swept back through me. I could not sleep. I put the letters and photographs in a drawer and went out again along the coast. Far to the north, across the water, there was a scrub fire. A broken, ruby-red line ate its way across a mountain as a line of fire ate its way through me. What was I, after all? Near enough what conscience had had me told. Nothing but the net sum of countless wrong turnings. I dismissed most of the Freudian jargon of the trial, but all my life I had tried to turn life into fiction, to hold reality away. Always I had acted as if a third person was watching and listening and giving me marks for good or bad behavior, a god like a novelist, to whom I turned like a character with the power to please, the sensitivity to feel slighted, the ability to adapt himself to whatever he believed the novelist god wanted. This leech-like variation of the super-ego 
I had created myself, fostered myself, and because of it I had always been incapable of acting freely. It was not my defense, but my despot, and now I saw it, I saw a death too late. I sat by the shore and waited for the dawn to rise on the gray sea, intolerably alone.